Okay. Um, moving on to the other major enzymatic activity from this class that also is consistently um, dysregulated in aggressive cancer cells. This was an interesting case because this was one of these enzymes that has a KIAA names, which if you are genome hackers, you'll, you'll recognize that. That means we have no idea what it does. Um, uh, using largely shRNA technologies, Kyle Cheng in our lab a few years, a few years ago was able to determine uh, that this enzyme uh, regulates an unusual class of lipids in cancer cells that are ether lipids. So this may look normal to you, but if you look more closely, most of our lipids have an ester bond that links the fatty acid group to glycerol. These are actually ether lipids that lack that bond. And in fact, um, when we just made this finding, we looked through the literature and were surprised to note that dysregulated ether meta metabolism is one of the oldest un relatively well understood metabolic changes in cancer cells. Fred Snyder's lab back in the 60s uh, determined that cancer cells dramatically upregulate ether lipid content compared to normal cells. What had remained enigmatic was the enzymes that drove that metabolic change and its pathological significance. And so Kyle was able to map 1363 as an enzyme that was driving some of this uh, metabolic change, but we didn't really have at that point a legitimate 1363 inhibitor to test the enzyme's function uh, in more detail. And so again, using our competitive activity profiling technologies, J. Wan Chang in our lab developed a very effective 1363 inhibitor. And this works uh, both in cancer cells to selectively block 1363 activity, again in this activity gel. So this is a Enzymes a doublet for a different reason. It's, it's glycosylated. Um, and it works in vivo. So oral administration, you could completely block 1363 in the brain where it happens to be um, highly expressed. Uh, so very versatile compound, um, very selective. Um, and when, when Jay went back and asked the question, what does this compound do um, to aggressive cancer cells, you see that, as you might suspect, the monoalkyl glycerol ethers, uh, sub, that the products of this enzymatic reaction, are suppressed by blocking uh, 1363. Um, uh, this results, again, in a, in a reduction in migration and invasion in response to inhibiting the enzyme um, and a substantial reduction in tumor growth, um, but not a complete reduction in tumor growth. And I think someone, maybe uh, Professor Deng earlier mentioned that, that metabolic enzyme targets might be combination therapy targets, I think you said. And I, I actually agree with that completely, at least in, in the targets we've looked at so far. We slow tumor growth, but we don't completely block tumor growth. Um, one of the cool things about having um, uh, the activity profiling technology at our disposal, though, is we can, ask, we can answer the question, is this incomplete block of tumor growth a problem with our molecule, our small molecule, or is it a problem with the fact that the target isn't sufficiently capable of suppressing tumor growth? And we can actually answer that question unequivocally by just isolating tumors from this animal and asking the question, is the 1363 enzyme completely blocked uh, in response to inhibition with our small molecule? And the answer to that question is yes. So the upper and lower band of this triplet are 1363, this, this other hydrolase is, is distinct. And you can see that those, uh, both those bands are completely blocked in, in tumors treated with a small molecule. So we know this is, if you will, the maximum possible effect in this tumor model that we're going to get from this small molecule. Another nice feature of these sorts of inhibitors, as, once you make them selective, is they can become imaging probes in and of themselves. So Jane had noted that the leaving group, this is actually a covalent inhibitor through a carbamylation reaction with, with, with 13C3, the leaving group is the major driver of selectivity for 13C3 over other enzymes, which means you can swap out this group with a fluorophore, like a bodipi dye, and this allows you to then directly image selective labeling of 1363 uh, relative to other hydrolases by gel and also um, in, in, in cancer cells. And so we're hopeful that we can maybe even flip these into in vivo imaging tools. You can imagine that some of these metabolic enzymes may themselves be interesting uh, biomarkers, if you will, of, of cancer uh, pathogenesis and progression um, in vivo. And, and these sorts of tools could be really useful from, from that perspective. Okay, so I wanted to spend the last few minutes on um, some more recent data that we really don't know, understand com completely yet, um, but just for the sake of being provocative, uh, I, I, will, I will present them to you and, and see what you think. Um, we don't really understand why aggressive cancer cells overexpress this neutral ether lipid pathway, um, but you can see that as cancer cells go from being non-aggressive to aggressive, they, they, they almost invariably possess huge levels of these neutral ether lipids. So what we do know, as we've looked at trying to understand how these ether lipids are regulated, is that they show remarkable density-dependent production. So if you look at these aggressive cancer cells and measure their ether lipid content as based on their density, you will see that as the cancer cells become highly dense or, or confluent, they substantially elevate these ether lipids. And you don't see this with other classes of, of lipid biomolecules. So this is something that's really quite special. In fact, we've done broad metabolomic profiling of lipids, at least, in a density-dependent manner, and these ether lipids are one of the few, if only, changes um, that you observe. Uh, that change in um, ether lipid content is completely dependent on 1363. If you block um, the enzyme with the small molecule inhibitor, you will, you will block this ether lipid accumulation. The other really curious feature that we've noted is that if you take non-natural versions of these ether lipids, they induce their own production. So if you treat cancer cells with, say, a C13-labeled monoalkylglycerol ether, it causes dramatic elevations 
in, ether, in endogenous ether lipids in these, in these, animal, in these cells. Um, and this is not 1363 dependent. It's somewhere um, downstream. So, so to summarize, what we know is that these, these lipids show density dependent increases in their production, and they can induce their own production. So to me, that sounds like a quorum sensing molecule. And we are not the first to suggest that cancer cells might possess some sort of quorum sensing mechanism. Um, what I think has been unclear is whether is what the identity of molecules might be in cancer cells that would allow them to sense their own population density. Um, and so we're quite interested in, in, in trying to delve into this mechanism further. In fact, I should say that almost all the data I just showed you about this density-dependent production was, developed, was generated by Ray Morling, a new postdoc in the lab who did his PhD at Harvard with um, Greg Verdine. And so Ray is interested in trying to understand um, the role that 1363 plays in this pathway and how ether lipids can induce their own production and what this might how this might relate to, say, the pro-migratory and pro-invasive activities of this uh, pathway. Um, so um, finally, uh, we've been also very interested in understanding uh, what sort of features other than just these dysregulated uh, lipolytic enzymes uh, do uh, these aggressive cancer cells share, with the hypothesis being if we could understand those features, we might be able to understand how these enzymes are regulated. So we've done global gene expression profiling on all these pairs of aggressive and non-aggressive cancer cells, about a dozen or so now, and I'm showing you a subset of that data. And asked, we asked, Dan Nomura asked the question, uh, what other uh, gene markers show a similar uh, correlative uh, expression, being high in the aggressive cells versus the non-aggressive cancer cells? And quite interestingly, um, virtually all uh, the annotated uh, uh, markers that fall in that category belong to those that are found to be elevated in cancer stem cells and, uh, and, and induced by epithelial to mesenchymal transition. So, um, so Bob Weinberg's lab here, obviously, at MIT, was one of the first to show this overlap in gene expression profiles between EMT and uh, cancer stemness. Um, and, and our data would argue that uh, MAGL and 30 c 3 are metabolic signatures um, of, that, um, of that change. Uh, and they're not, interestingly, uh, the only metabolic signatures. In fact, there's about 30 or 40 metabolic enzymes that show uh, similar uh, uh, footprints or, 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 or signatures profiles, and I'd say that the vast majority, if not all of them, have yet to be characterized uh, in cancer. Um, so we're quite excited by the idea that we might be uncovering fundamental metabolic changes that occur in cancer cells as they undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transition or, or enter a stem-like um, uh, state. Okay, just um, in the last one or two minutes to put a, a shout out to anyone who might be a chemist uh, in the audience. Um, this whole meeting is about uh, metabolism and as it relates to cancer. And it is stunning to me uh, as a chemical biologist uh, to realize that despite the fact that many metabolic pathways have been characterized for nearly 100 years in one shape, form, or another, the amount of pharmacological tool at the number of pharmacological tools at our disposal to actually interrogate these pathways is woefully limited. In fact, if you just take the hydrolase family as an example, prior to activity profiling, we had selective in vivo active inhibitors for less than 5% of this class. You can say, well, maybe people don't care about hydrolases, right? And, um, but in reality, in the cases where these compounds have been developed, they've proven to be very useful, not only as, as basic research tools, but also as drugs. So we have DPP-4 inhibitors today to treat type 2 diabetes. We have cholinesterase inhibitors to treat symptom, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And we have other compounds in various stages of clinical development. Um, so our lab, um, just through our sort of mom and pop pharmacology efforts using activity profiling, have more than doubled the number of enzymes in this class for which there are in vivo active selective inhibitors. And we've got good leads for a large fraction of the family. And I can tell you, we're not very good med chemists. So, so this isn't that hard to do. It's just that no one's really focused on it yet. In fact, if you go down the glycolytic pathway, and those who study it know there's almost no useful pharmacological matter to study the glycolytic pathway right now. And I think this is just for a lack of effort. It's not for a degree of difficulty. Um, so, uh, and just finally, from the perspective of the basic science of this, um, there was really a fantastic commentary. I should give credit to Steve Fry and Alec Edwards that came out in Nature a few months ago where they um, asked the simple question, why do academic researchers generally spend, 95% of them spend most of their time on 5% of the known pathways in biology? Um, and, and I think their point was that they felt that um, the only common denominator amongst the pathways that are very heavily investigated um, in biology is that there were good pharmacological tools to study them. Um, and that certainly is the case with the hydrolases. If you could lose publication density as some sort of barometer of the degree of understanding and, and, and intensity of effort on a target, you can see that in cases where we've had good inhibitors for many years, all of these targets have high publication density. What's nice about activity profiling, it is totally agnostic towards the degree of understanding of the enzyme target. And so we can actually develop inhibitors that cover this whole span of stretch. And I think chemoproteomics in general will be very valuable for di digging into these uh, low or zero publication density portions of metabolism and applying pharmacological tools to help annotate um, those targets.
Okay, so I started with this slide. Let me um, finish with this slide. And I hope that I've convinced you that activity profiling and other chemoproteomic methods can be useful for uh, discovering enzymes that are dysregulated in cancer and, and, and other diseases, and also then discover inhibitors to annotate the function of those proteins. Um, I, I would like to say, especially if there are students in the audience, that where we are bottlenecked today in metabolism, in my opinion, is not actually developing inhibitors to study the function of these enzymes. I think that can be done. We are bottlenecked by, an inc in my opinion, by insufficient capacity to profile the metabolome in a comprehensive manner. That is the biggest challenge that we face. We have plenty of inhibitors for totally uncharacterized enzymes that we know we inhibit in vivo, and we do our standard metabolomic experiment and we see nothing change. And I don't think it's because nothing's changing. I think it's because we're not capable of visualizing the changes because we don't have uh, sufficient uh, analytical technologies available to us to broadly profile and deeply profile metabolism. And I think that's a great challenge for students to think about um, in, in the future. Um, okay, so uh, I mentioned most of these individuals all along the way, but just to reiterate, uh, John Long uh, created the maglipase inhibitor that Dan Nomura used to uh, uh, determine that maglipase plays a role in fatty acid metabolism in cancer cells. Uh, Jay created the 1363 inhibitor and then used that in combination with Ray Morling to map ether lipid metabolism in cancer cells um, and, 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 its, and its role in, in, in cancer. And um, these are the funding sources that keep us supported, and, and thank you again for the invitation um, to, to be at this meeting.